Hello criminal law students, welcome back. This is part 2 of Justifying Circumstances under Article 11. In part 1, we discussed self-defense as well as battered woman syndrome under Republic Act 9262, otherwise known as the Anti-Violence Against Women and Their Children. We also covered incomplete self-defense. We mentioned that there is an incomplete self-defense when all of the elements or requirements for self-defense are not present and it can either be an ordinary mitigating circumstance under Article 13, Paragraph 1 or a privileged mitigating circumstance under Article 69. Either way, the accused or the offender is still criminally liable. If it is an ordinary mitigating circumstance under Article 13, Paragraph 1, the effect is that if there are two indivisible penalties, you impose the lower penalty and if the penalty is divisible into periods, you impose the minimum period of the penalty. If it is privileged mitigating circumstance under Article 69, you lower the penalty by one or two degrees subject to the discretion of the court. In this video, we will discuss the remaining justifying circumstances under Article 11 which are defense of relatives, defense of a stranger, state of necessity, fulfillment of duty, and obedience to an order. So let's start. We already mentioned in part 1 of the video that in self-defense, paragraph 1, defense of relatives, paragraph 2, and defense of strangers, paragraph 3 of article 11, pareho lang ang first and second requisites, unlawful aggression and reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel it. Magkaiba lang ang kanilang third requisite. Now let's start with defense of relatives under paragraph 2. Now who are the relatives being defended under paragraph 2? Ito po sila. Spouse, ascendants, descendants, legitimate, natural, or adopted brothers and sisters, or relatives by affinity in the same degrees. Relatives by consanguinity within the fourth civil degree. Now, sino-sino ang mga ascendants? From the word ascend, meaning upward. Kung ikaw ito, ang ascendants mo ay ang parents mo and grandparents mo. Now, how about your descendants? From the word descend, meaning pababa or downward. Kapag ikaw ito, ang descendants mo ay ang children mo and grandchildren. Now, how about relatives by consanguinity within the fourth civil degree? Ang consanguinity, it comes from the Latin word consanguinius, of blood, meaning blood relatives mo. So, paano mo i-compute ang degree? For example, sa brother mo. Kailangan mo lang alamin kung sino ang nearest common ancestor. Ang nearest common ancestor ninyo ng brother mo ay, of course, ang father ninyo. Kaya, galing sa'yo papunta sa father mo, that's the first degree, and papunta sa bro brother mo, that's the second degree. So, your brother Brother is your second degree relative by consanguinity. Now how about your uncle? Again, hanapin mo lang kung sino ang inyong nearest common ancestor. And sa case ng uncle mo, yun ay ang lolo, lolo mo or ang father niya. So galing sa'yo papunta sa father mo, that's first degree. And then father mo papunta sa grandfather mo, that's second degree. And papunta sa uncle mo, that's third degree. Kasi yung grandfather, yun yung nearest common ancestor ninyo ng uncle mo. And then how about your cousin? Same pa rin. Ang, common, ang nearest common ancestor ninyo ay ang grandfather. Ang isang degree kasi ay isang generation. Kung hanapin mo naman yung nearest common ancestor ninyo ng cousin mo, yun ay ang lolo ninyo, the grandfather. So kung bibilangin mo, galing sa'yo papunta sa father mo, that's first. Then papunta Papunta sa grandfather, that's second. Then pababa sa uncle, that's third. And then papunta sa cousin, that's fourth. Your cousin is now your fourth civil degree relative by consanguinity. How about the relatives by affinity within the same degree? Pag sinabing affinity, yan yung by marriage. So dito, sa parents-in-law, yan yung parents ng asawa mo. Sa sister-brother-in-law, brother or sister ng asawa mo. And sa son or daughter-in-law, yan yung asawa ng anak mo na babae or lalaki. Sila na po ngayon yung mga relatives under paragraph 2. Article 11, for example, yung live-in partner mo, we call that your common law spouse. Pag sinabing common law spouse, wala pong benefit of marriage, hindi po kayo kasal. So kapag dinefend mo siya, pinagtanggol mo yung common law wife mo or yung live-in partner mo, hindi po siya defense of relatives, kundi defense of a stranger. Let us now go to the requisites of defense of relatives. We have number one, unlawful aggression. Number two, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel it. Number three, in case the provocation was given by the person attacked, the one making the defense had no part therein. Example, A saw B walking with his brother C. A pulled out his knife and tried to stab B, but B stepped back. A was about to stab B again, but C, who was then armed, pulled out his gun and shot A, who died as a consequence. So dito, meron pong unlawful aggression on the part of the attacker. And dinefend lang ni C yung kapatid niya. Now this is an example of defense of relative. Another example, A 
A saw B walking with his brother C. B ran towards A and tried to stab him with a knife but A blocked the attack. A also pulled out his knife and tried to stab B but C intervened and shot A who died as a consequence. So kung titignan nyo sa example na to, ang unlawful aggressor dito ay yung kapatid at hindi yung victim. At dahil sa walang unlawful aggression sa part ng victim kasi nga he was merely defending himself sa unlawful aggression, hindi po mahuhulog ito as defense of a relative kasi there is no unlawful aggression. And we mentioned in part 1 that unlawful aggression is a condition sine qua non. Kapag wala pong unlawful aggression, walang defense. Either self-defense, defense of relatives, or defense of a stranger. Next, unlawful aggression may depend upon the honest belief of the one making the defense. For example, one saw his enemy Pedro. One rushed towards Pedro and tried to hack him with a bolo but missed. When one tried to hack Pedro again, one lost balance and fell. Pedro pulled out his own bolo and raised it as Juan was trying to get up to attack Pedro once more. Bruno, Juan's brother, arrived and saw Pedro who was about to hack Juan. Bruno shot Pedro who did not know that Juan was the one who attacked first. So sa example na to, ang unlawful aggressor dito ay si Juan kasi he tried to hack Pedro. Si Pedro, he was just merely defending himself. Nung dumating si Bruno, akala niya ang unlawful aggressor ay si Pedro at hindi si Juan kasi inaabutan niya si Pedro na he was about to hack Juan. Ang akala niya, si Pedro ang unlawful aggressor ay pinagtanggol niya lang yung kapatid niya kaya binaril niya si Pedro pero hindi niya alam si Juan pala ang unlawful aggressor doon. Now, can he invoke the justifying circumstance of the defense of relatives? The answer is yes. Kasi nga, unlawful aggression may depend upon the honest belief of the one making the defense. Kasi ang paniniwala niya, ang honest belief niya ay si Pedro ang unlawful aggressor doon. Kaya, his act of shooting Pedro in order to save his brother one is justified. Let us now go to the third requisite or element of defense of relatives, which is, in case the provocation was given by the person attacked, the one making the defense had no part therein. Etong person attacked, it refers to the relative being defense Defended. At the one making the defense had no part therein. Ibig sabihin, yung person na nagde-defend, dapat hindi siya nakisali sa provocation. Hindi niya pre-novoke yung victim. Ang nag-provoke lang ng victim ay yung relative being defended. Example, Leng was with her brother Cardo when she saw her enemy Ivana selling barbecue. Leng approached Ivana and hurled invectives at her, calling her, Igat ka, malande, pokpok, maduming babae, inaga mo boyfriend ko na si Saito. Infuriated, Ivana grabbed the knife she was using and tried to stab Leng but missed. Ivana tried to stab Leng again but Cardo pulled out his gun and shot Ivana to death. Dito, merong provocation sa part ng relative being defended or si Leng pre-novoke niya si Ivana. Pero merong pa rin justifying circumstance of defense of relative kasi the person defending did not take part sa provocation. Another example, Pia was with her brother Aklas when she saw her enemy Mia selling barbecue. Aklas approached Mia and hurled invectives at her, calling her igat ka, malande, pok Pok, maduming babae, inagaw mo boyfriend, ng kapatid ko na si Doggy. Infuriated, Mia grabbed the knife she was using and tried to stab Pia but missed. Mia tried to stab Pia again but Aklas pulled out his gun and shot Mia to death. In this example, the person making the defense took part in the provocation. Siya yung nag-provoke sa victim at hindi yung relative being defended. And since nag-take part siya ng provocation, he provoked the victim. The, pre the third requirement or element is therefore not present, he will be liable. It will just be a case of an incomplete defense of relatives. So kung meron tayong incomplete self-defense, meron ding incomplete defense of relatives. Let us now discuss defense of strangers under paragraph 3. Now what are the elements or requirements of defense of strangers? There are three. All of this must be present so that a person can validly invoke the justifying circumstance of defense of strangers. We have unlawful aggression, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel it, the person defending be not induced by revenge, resentment, or other evil motive. Now, who are deemed strangers? Any person not included in the enumeration of relatives mentioned in paragraph 2 of article 11. We already enumerated who are the relatives for the purpose of applying defense of relatives. Kapag hindi siya pasok sa enumeration ng relatives, he or she will be considered as a stranger. Like for example, yung live-in partner or yung common law spouse mo. Since ang spouse na nire-refer sa paragraph 2 of article 11 ay yung asawa mo, which means dapat kasal kayo, ang common law spouse or ang live-in partner is 
considered as stranger. So kapag ipinagtanggol mo siya, it will not fall under defense of relative but defense of stranger. Now let's proceed to the third requirement or element. The person defending be not induced by revenge, resentment, or other evil motive. In other words, the person making the defense must not be motivated by revenge. Dapat yung pagde-defend niya ay hindi dahil sa gusto niya lang magigante or dahil sa meron siyang evil motive. Hindi niya ginawang reason yung pagde-defend sa isang tao because he wanted to exact revenge or he wanted to materialize his or her evil motive. Example, while A was walking, he heard screams and ran towards the sound. A saw K trying to stab X. A resented K because they exchanged fist blows a month ago. A pulled out his knife and stabbed K to prevent him from stabbing X. Dito, hindi present ang third requirement kasi the person making the defense was induced by revenge. Kasi nga, meron silang history before. And since hindi present ang third requirement, the person making the defense is criminally liable. But he will benefit from an incomplete defense of strangers. And then we have state of necessity under paragraph 4. There are three requisites or elements of state of necessity. Number one, that the evil sought to be avoided actually exists. That the injury feared be greater than that done to avoid it. Number three, that there be no other practical and less harmful means of preventing it. Dito, when we say damage, it may mean injury to persons or damage to property. Now this is an example of injury to persons. While A was driving carefully one night, an unlighted truck in the opposite direction swerved to his lane and was heading towards him. In a split-second decision, A turned violently to the right where he ran over a bicycle rider who died. Now, if we look at the elements or requirements of state of necessity, the evil sought to be avoided actually exists. Now, sa case na to, yung evil or yung panganib dito ay injury to one's person kasi nga mababangga niya yung truck na walang ilaw. And it may result to serious physical injuries or baka sarili niyang death that the injury feared be greater than that done to avoid it. So the injury feared ay possible death or serious physical injuries. And then, ang ginawa niya na lang is nag-swerve siya to the right para maiwasan yon. And then, pag-swerve niya sa right, meron palang bicycle rider doon na, na, na nabangga niya at namatay. That there be no other practical and less harmful means of preventing it. So dito sa case na to, it was a split second decision. Wala na siyang time mag-remunerate. Wala na siyang time mag-reflect. Kaya, kinabig niya na lang pakanan in order to avoid the impending accident. Another example of damage to property. Example of damage to property. Five nipa huts owned by different people were built just one meter apart from each other. The farthest nipa hut caught fire and in order to prevent the burning of the other nipa huts, one of the owners pulled down and destroyed the adjoining nipa hut. So dito, yung evil, dito sa case na to, the evil sought to be avoided ay yung pagkasira ng other remaining nipa huts. So ang ginawa nila, sinira na lang nila yung adjoining ng nipa hat para hindi na kumalat yung apoy kasi nga magkakatabi lang yung nipa hat so merong damage to property doon in order to save the other remaining nipa hats take note the evil sought to be avoided must not be attributable to the person raising the justifying circumstance ini ang ibig sabihin nito yung panganib na iniiwasan mo ay hindi nanggaling sa kapabayaan mo o sa negligence mo o dahil sa felonious act mo example he was driving beyond the speed limit one night because he was in a hurry because of the speed, A lost control and was headed directly towards a tree. To avoid the tree, he swerved to the left where he hit a pedestrian who died on the spot. Is this an example of state of necessity? No. Kasi yung panganib na gusto niyang iwasan ay nanggaling sa kanyang kapabayaan because he was not observing the speed limit and because he was negligent at that time, he therefore cannot invoke the justifying circumstance of state of necessity. He will be liable for the consequence of his felonious act. Felonious act siya dahil ang negligence ay felony under Article 365. Take note of the third requisite of the state of necessity that there be no other practical and less harmful means of preventing it. Example, the truck carrying gasoline was parked in the gasoline station. It caught fire and started to burn. To prevent the station from being destroyed, they pushed the truck away and its momentum made it crash against the house of X which also burned as a result. So the evil that they tried to avoid here is yung pagsabog ng gasoline station. At para hindi sumabog, tinulak na lang nila papalayo yung truck. Yung truck naman ngayon is nag-crash 
sa house which caused the house to burn. Kapag wala nang ibang way para maiwasan yung pagkasunog ng bahay, then it will fall under state of necessity at hindi magiging liable yung mga nagtulak ng truck na yon. Pero kapag may ibang area naman kung saan walang house, pwede nilang itulak yung truck doon, magiging liable sila ngayon sa pagkasunog ng bahay. Kasi the third element is not present. Kailangan no other practical and less harmful means. So kung meron naman palang practical means, like for example, itulak nila yung truck sa lugar na kung saan walang bahay or walang tao para walang masira na gamit, then they should have pursued that course of action. At dahil sa nasunog yung bahay and there are other less harmful ways to avoid the injury, magiging liable sila ngayon. Kasi nga, hindi present ang number 3. In part 1, we mentioned na there is no criminal and civil liability. Kasi nga, the person acted in accordance with law and because he acted in accordance with law, he is deemed not to have transgressed the law. Wala siyang nilabag na batas. At dahil wala siyang nilabag na batas, there is no criminal and civil liability. If you read Article 100, Civil Liability of a Person Guilty of Felony, it states that every person criminally liable for a felony is also civilly liable. Pero dito, since the person is not criminally liable, therefore, there is no civil liability. Pero sinabi rin natin na there is an exception. Ang exception dito ay paragraph 4. Ito na yung state of necessity. Now, dito sa state of necessity, paragraph 4, we have to read it in conjunction with Article 101 of the Revised Penal Code. Rules regarding civil liability in certain cases. The exemption from criminal liability established in Subdivision 4 of Article 11 of this code does not include exemption from civil liability. So sa subdivision 4, which is state of necessity, it does not include exemption from civil liability. So merong civil liability. And then, in cases falling within subdivision 4 of Article 11, the persons for whose benefit the harm has been prevented shall be civilly liable. Ito yung na-mention natin before na yung civil liability not necessarily incurred by the person performing the act. Kasi ang magiging civilly liable ay yung person na nag-benefit sa situation for whose benefit the harm has been prevented. Example, A had a barn full of cows. The neighboring property owned by B was filled with crops and vegetables. One day, while X was walking, he saw the barn was burning. To save the cows, he opened the doors of the barn and all the cows went to the neighbor's land where they destroyed the crops and vegetables. So sa case na to, yung barn ni A ay merong mga baka. Sa kabilang property ay pag-aari ni B kung saan maraming nakatanim ng mga vegetables. Dahil sa nasusunog yung barn, si X ngayon, yung nakakita ng sunog, binuksan niya yung barn. And then yung mga baka, pumunta sa property ni B kung saan may mga vegetables at nasira yung mga vegetables. Ang question, sino ba dito sa kanila ang magiging civilly liable? Si X ba na nagbukas ng barn? The answer is, hindi si X, kundi si A, yung may-ari ng cows. Kasi under Article 101, siya ang nag-benefit Kung hindi sana binuksan yung barn, masusunog sana lahat ng baka niya. So since siya ang nag-benefit, siya ngayon ang magiging civilly liable. The person for whose benefit the harm has been prevented shall be civilly liable. And then we have paragraph 5 which is fulfillment of duty. Now there are only two requirements in order for fulfillment of duty to be validly invoked as a justifying circumstance. First, that the accused acted in the performance of a duty or in the lawful exercise of a right or office, that the injury caused or the offense committed be the necessary consequence of the due performance of duty or the lawful exercise of such right or office. Now, in Rule 113 of the Rules of Court, under Section 2, it states that no violence or unnecessary force shall be used in making an arrest, and the person arrested shall not be subject to any greater restraint than is necessary for his detention. So, for example, sa warrantless arrest, if the officer is trying to arrest a certain person, kailangan yung force na gagamitin niya ay reasonably necessary in order to arrest the person. Hindi niya kailangang mag-employ ng force which is greater than what is necessary in order to restrain the person. And dito sa doctrine of self-help na mention natin to under self-defense. Sinabi natin na merong right yung owner or lawful possessor na i-exclude o pagbawalan yung ibang tao na pakialaman yung property niya. And one way of exercising that right is to use such force as may be reasonably necessary to repel or prevent an actual or 
threaten unlawful physical invasion or usurpation. Tandaan, the right to exclude. Now dito, under this paragraph, lawful exercise of a right, it is not necessary that there be unlawful aggression against the person charged with the protection of the property. Tandaan sa requirements or requisites ng fulfillment of duty or exercise of a right, di ba, merong dalawa. Walang na-mention na unlawful aggression. Kaya ang sinasabi ni Reyes na kung walang unlawful aggression, you can still invoke paragraph 5 or fulfillment of duty or exercise of a right. Now, if there is unlawful aggression, then you apply paragraph 1 of article 11, which is self-defense. Kasi nga, you can defend your person or your rights. So kapag merong unlawful aggression, you apply paragraph 1, which is self-defense. Kasi an unlawful aggression is an element of self-defense. Kapag walang unlawful aggression at may nangialam ng property mo, you apply paragraph 5 or exercise of a right. Example, A issued post-dated checks in favor of JG Corporation, a subdivision developer. JG Corporation failed to develop his unit within the time limit, so A gave a stop payment order to the bank. When the checks were presented for payment, the PDCs bounced. JG Corporation filed a criminal case of BP22 against A. So kinasuhan si A kasi nga nag-bounce yung check and that is a violation of Batas Pambansa bilang 22 under the Bouncing Checks Law. Question. Meron bang lusot si A dito? Is there any defense available for A? The answer is yes. Under Presidential Decree Number 957, dito sa Section 23, it gives A the right to suspend installment payments if the owner or subdivision developer fails to develop the unit in accordance with the approved plans and within the time limit for complying with the same. So since dito, subdivision developer failed to develop the unit within the time limit, a can therefore valid the exercise his statutory right provided by PD 957 and that is a justifying circumstance. Next example, Jejemon was sent to the emergency room. His right leg was amputated to prevent the disease from spreading elsewhere. Upon regaining consciousness after the operation, the parents of Jejemon filed a criminal case of mutilation against the surgeon. So is the surgeon criminally liable for mutilation? The answer is no. Kasi nga, he was merely exercising his office. Kailangan niyang putulin yung right leg in order to prevent the disease from spreading elsewhere. Baka yun pa ang maging sanhi ng pagkamatay ni Jejemon. Let us now discuss the last and final justifying circumstance under Article 11, which is obedience to a lawful order under Paragraph 6. Now, there are three requisites so that you can invoke obedience to a lawful order as a justifying circumstance. Number one, that an order has been issued by a superior. Ibig sabihin, merong order. At yung order na yun ay nanggaling sa superior mo. You are a subordinate of that officer. Kapag inutusan ka ng fellow officer mo having the same rank or equal rank, then that is not an order as contemplated by the first requirement. Kailangan yung order na yun ay manggaling sa superior. And then, such order must be for some lawful purpose. So yung order na yun, kailangan meron siyang lawful purpose. Kapag wala siyang lawful purpose, then there is no obligation on your part to follow the order or to comply with the order or accomplish the order. Number three, that the means used by the subordinate to carry out said order is lawful. So yung pamamaraan na gagamitin mo in order to comply comply with the order or para ma-fulfill yung order ay dapat lawful at legal. Example, A was ordered by his police superior B to torture the arrested prisoner to elicit a confession and to make him feel the pain he caused to the families of his victims. Dito, i-check natin kung complete ba lahat ang requirements sa obedience to a lawful order. Number one, that an order has been issued by a superior. Dito sa example, obviously, yung superior niya ang nag-issue ng order. And then, such order must be for some lawful purpose. Dito, Yung order ba na binigay is for a lawful purpose? The answer is no. Kasi isa sa mga purposes niya ay to make him feel the pain he caused to the families of his victims. In other words, hindi lawful yung order. Hindi siya for a lawful purpose. At kahit sa number 3, that the means used by the subordinate to carry out said order is lawful, yung means na ginamit dito ay hindi lawful. In fact, this is punished under Republic Act number no. 9745, otherwise known as the Anti-Torture Act of 2009. Under Section 3, maliwanag sa definition ng torture, refers to an act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person. 
So dito, apparently, tinorture yung arrested prisoner. And yung means na ginamit ay hindi lawful because it is a violation of Republic Act 9745. And maltreating a prisoner is also punished under the revised penal code, particularly Article 235, which is maltreatment of prisoners. If you maltreat prisoners under your charge, who is either a convict or a detention prisoner, you can be held liable for that crime. So kayo, you have to be very careful, lalo na kung sundalo na kayo, o pulis na kayo, or nasa government na kayo. You You have to be very careful pagdating sa order ng superior ninyo. Kailangan ninyong alamin kung lawful ba ito. At kung lawful naman, yung pamamaraan na gagamitin ninyo or yung means na i-employ ninyo para i-accomplish yung order must be lawful. Otherwise, magiging liable po kayo niyan. And what's worse, you can be held criminally liable, not only administratively liable. To wrap things up, let us review ordinary mitigating circumstance and privilege mitigating circumstance in relation to justifying circumstances under Article 11. Na-mention natin na there is an ordinary mitigating circumstance under Article 13, Paragraph 1 when all the requisites necessary to justify the act are not attendant. So dito, sinabi natin na kailangang merong one out of three requirements. Kapag present ang isang requirement, meron lamang ordinary mitigating circumstance. At kapag present naman ang two out of three requirements or majority of such conditions are present, merong privilege mitigating circumstance. So kailangang two out of three. At kapag merong privilege mitigating circumstance, we lower the penalty by one or two degrees than that prescribed by law. Dito, kapag present ang unlawful aggression sa self-defense, defense of relatives, defense of strangers, meron lamang ordinary mitigating circumstance. At sinabi natin na unlawful aggression is very important. Kapag walang unlawful aggression, walang defense, either self-defense, defense of relatives, or defense of strangers. Kasi unlawful aggression is a condition sine qua non. So kung merong one out of three, merong ordinary mitigating circumstance. At dito sa state of necessity at obedience to a lawful order, kapag meron ding one out of three, merong ordinary mitigating circumstance. Now, ang effect ng ordinary mitigating circumstance sa penalty ay kapag merong two indivisible penalties like reclusion perpetua to death, we impose the lesser penalty, which is reclusion perpetua. Just read Article 63. At kapag ang penalty ay divisible penalty, having three periods, we impose it in the minimum period. And you have to be guided by paragraph 2 of Article 64 and Article 76. Now, paano kung majority ay present or two out of three? Like dito sa self-defense, defense of relatives, and defense of strangers. Paano kung present ang 1 and 2 requirements or 1 and 3 requirements? Magkakaroon ng privilege mitigating circumstance. At ang effect nito ay we lower the penalty by 1 or 2 degrees under Article 69. So ang sa homicide, ang imposable penalty ay reclusion temporal. So if we lower it by 1 degree, prison mayor. If 2 degrees, prison correctional. And we learned earlier na it is up to the judge or it is up to the court whether to lower the penalty by 1 or 2 degrees. Now, paano sa fulfillment of duty? Kasi meron lang two requirements. Paano natin malaman kung majority ba ay present? This question has already been answered by the court in the case of People v. Oanis. In this case, the court considered the existence or presence of one of the two requisites as constituting majority. In other words, one out of two that is already considered as majority. So dito sa fulfillment of duty, kapag present ang isa out of two that is already considered as majority at kapag majority na, Naturally, we apply Article 69. And kapag in-apply natin Article 69, magiging privilege mitigating circumstance na siya. So we lower the penalty by 1 or 2 degrees. According to Reyes, sinabi niya na there is no ordinary mitigating circumstance under Article 13 Paragraph 1 when the justifying or exempting circumstance has two requisites only. So sa justifying or exempting circumstance, kapag ang requisites niya ay dalawa lang, walang ordinary mitigating circumstance. Bakit? Kasi kapag dalawa lang ang requisites, present ang one out of two, mauhulog na siya under Article 69 at hindi na as an ordinary mitigating circumstance. So ito ang minimin niya kapag sinabi niyang there is no ordinary mitigating circumstance when the justifying or exempting circumstance has two requisites only. So that's it. Sana may natutunan kayo or sana na-refresh ang memory ninyo dahil siguro napag-aralan nyo na ang mga to. Once again, thank you for your time. Study hard and pray harder.